take a closer look at prayer, how God used this to grow the church, and turn the world upside down. I came across a little prayer recently titled, A Morning Prayer for Help. A Morning Prayer for Help. This is how it goes. Dear God, so far today, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped, lost my temper. I haven't been nasty or selfish. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed for the day. And from then on, I'm going to need all the help I can get. I think we respond to prayer, each of us, in different ways. Maybe one of a few different ways. For some, it's just indifference. Ah, a sermon on prayer, a book on prayer, okay, I'll pray, and it's more of a cliche. Somebody tells you something in their life, oh, I'll pray for you, and we never do. Boy, if if that was, a, if, you know, that's, if that kept us out of heaven, I think none of us would get in, right, if if that was the, the thing. But some of us, it's just indifference, it's it's prayer, you know. For some, it's confusion. Maybe you don't know how to pray. Don't, man, I, I, a prayer life, a prayer routine, it's not a habit, not really sure even how to get started. I think for some, it's conviction. You read about people like Martin Luther in his prayer life or uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer who lived during the time of uh, Hitler and, and his prayer routine. And some of these people, even of today, and you're like, oh, wow, I hear about prayer and I'm convicted because I don't do that. I don't pray that way. And then for a small few, and these are the gems of the Christian community, prayer is a delight. Do you know people like that? Where prayer is a first instinct in their heart, it's a gut response, and for them it's just a delight. So what does our prayer life need to consist of in order for us to move from indifference to delight? We're going to be looking at Acts to search for some principles and see an example of what I think a powerful prayer life looks like. I'm going to move kind of from some general principles that we see to a specific example. So kind of hang with me on this. First, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So we've got the list here that we've been thinking about the last few weeks. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to fellowship, breaking of bread, we've covered those, and the prayers. The first principle to consider, the general principle, before we look into the specific example, is they prayed with consistency. Because if we go back to the beginning of this verse, they devoted themselves. If you were to read that in the Greek, it, it, it really would say they were continually devoting themselves. So that's not just to the teaching of the word and to gathering together for fellowship and the, the breaking of bread and the Lord's Supper, but also to prayer. It was a continual thing. So they prayed consistently. Go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 14. This is right after Acts 1, 14. This is right after Jesus gives them the final marching orders in Acts 1, 8. You're going to go into all the world, be my witnesses, Okay. And so then they're left and they go back to the upper room. It's the disciples and some of the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, some other people. Verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting, that's that same phrase, that continually devoting themselves to prayer. They were a people that consistently prayed. So that's one principle to look at. The second one, go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They prayed according to custom. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Let's look closely at the word, the words in verse 42. They devoted themselves to teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and the prayers. Your translation might say something a little bit different. The ESV or the New American Standard, I think even the New King James says the prayers. So it's a definite article, the prayers. Plural, prayers. Now you could say, well, aren't they just talking about prayer? Yes, but they're also talking about those customary cultural prayers of the first century. Same as last week. You could say, well, breaking of bread, isn't that talking about the Lord's Supper? But yes, but it was also talking about that 
common agape love feast that they were doing. It was both and. It was the breaking of bread, sharing the meal together, and then extending that naturally into communion, the Lord's Supper. Same thing, I think, with the prayers here. They were praying consistently, but they were also praying according to Jewish custom. Now, I'm not suggesting we do that, but let's let's glean what we can from that. So if we go to Acts 3, chapter 1, just, we're going to bounce around here. Just hang with me. Acts 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, sorry. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. The ninth hour, which in their clock would be about 3 p.m. So they were doing this according to Jewish custom. And you're like, wait a minute. These are New Testament believers. Jesus has come. The Old Testament has done been done away with. Not according to them. They were like, no, I, I now see fully what I only saw in part. Jesus is now fully made everything make sense. So they're still doing that. You go, we don't have to go there, but you go to Acts 17, and the phrase is, when Paul goes to the temple, as was his custom. Now, as a kid, I always thought Paul went to the temple just to cause problems and argue with people, and hey, this is where you're wrong. No, he went to pray. He was a dedicated Jewish believer. He went to pray. And in those times of prayer, he could have discussions. And then that's when he caused problems, right? But he went there to pray. In fact, if you go, you don't have to turn there. You can write it down and, and chew on this later. Psalm 55, 17. This idea of going often to the Lord throughout the day in kind of a, a habitual way goes all the way back to David. King David writes, morning. Noon and night, I cry out in my distress. That's a prayer. New King James translation of that verse says, I pr- it uses the word prayer. Morning, noon, and night, I cry out in my distress, and the Lord hears my voice. You fast forward some 500 years later to the time of Daniel in captivity. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. When Daniel knew, this is when the king had said, you will not, if you're Jewish, you will not pray according to your custom. You're not allowed to do that. But when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, so no prayer, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. We could probably uh, change that to, as was his custom. So it's the idea, they would, Jewish people would go the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour. That's 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. They'd go in the morning and they'd pray if they were near Jerusalem. If they weren't, they would just look towards Jerusalem. And you go, oh, wait a minute, that's like Islam, Muslim, look towards Mecca. Yeah, these people did it first. What? That was taken from this. And I'm not saying that makes you more righteous, but just look at the posture of the heart that says, that's my focus. 9 a.m. when I wake up, so it doesn't have to be at 9 a.m. That's legalism if we do that. But when I rise, as the old Fernando Ortega song of about 20 years ago, when I rise in the morning, give me Jesus. I want that to be my focus. At noon, at about my or midday, whatever that is for you on your schedule. If you're up on the slope, it's probably crazy. Whatever it is, at midday, <clears throat> orient me towards Jesus. And at the end of my day, and for the Jewish people, that would come earlier because then they would settle in earlier for the night. At the end of my day, which is not going to be 3 p.m. for us, whatever that is, Lord, orient my heart towards Jesus. So these... The early church, they prayed consistently and they prayed according to custom. So they did it in a, in a pattern, if you will. And oftentimes, and we have this in early writings, what did they pray? The Lord's Prayer. That, they prayed other things too, but that was uh, like the prayer oftentimes when they would gather and they would just simply, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. 
and they would do that. And it was, and it was a routine thing. Okay, so that's, that's the second principle. The third principle, just general principle, before we get too specific, they prayed as a first response. It was a, it was an instinctual gut response. <clears throat> Acts chapter 12, verse 5, I'll just read it. So this is when, um, uh, Peter was arrested, one of the times he was arrested. And, uh, so Peter was kept in the prison. But prayer for him was being made to God intensely by the church. You could say, well, how's that a gut response? Well, they didn't boycott. They didn't pick it. There was no social media. But if there had been, they wouldn't have been. Let's let's organize a protest and go down, have signs, justice for Peter and all this. They didn't do any of that. Their first response was to gather and pray. Sometimes you'll see that after a tragedy, a, a school shooting and things like that. And, and I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have action and do things, but you'll he- hear some people condemn and say, your prayers and your thoughts aren't enough. We need action. No, for a believer, prayer is action. It's a gut response that says, we can do more than this, but we must at least do this. And it was a gut response for them, depending on what was happening. If you do turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 24, we see this. Again, this is before uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit, before Pentecost, before the signs and wonders. And they're still like, okay, Jesus has just left. He told us to wait here in the upper room and we're praying, but now we have a problem. And you see that gut response. One of our, one of the 12 has committed suicide. Judas is dead. And that, that whole thing, I mean, he was a trusted friend. They, they weren't, see, we could be suspicious of Judas because we, we read the, we read the back of the book, right? <laughs> but we can look at him and go, yeah, I'm just waiting for him to, you know, be the traitor. But they didn't see him that way. And so to have that person all of a sudden, he's the one that betrayed the Lord. And now he's gone and killed himself. And now we have to what? The gut response is, we need to look at Acts chapter 1, verse 24. So they two men, uh, they put forward to replace Judas, verse 24, and they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. So it was a gut response to go, hey, what they could have done is they could have said, listen, let's have an interview process where we're going to have both of you character references, background checks, all these types of things. And we'll figure out by committee and by kind of logical best practices of hiring, which one of you No, Gut response, Lord, you who knows the hearts of men, which is an interesting phrase because God knew the heart of Judas. But they're giving up their own will to the will of the Lord as a gut response to say, Lord, you who knows the heart of man, direct us. You choose. So it was a gut response. So three, and, and I think these three principles are necessary as we kind of then dive into some specifics. So we have to understand they prayed consistently. It was a regular thing. They prayed according to some customs, which is okay to begin the day with prayer, end the day with prayer, middle of the day, throughout the day, whatever you're doing, praying with some with some habit. It's all right to, if you wake at seven every morning, then that's your prayer time. Do it habitually. If you have nothing else to pray except the groanings of your heart, pray the Lord's Prayer. Because the disciples who walked with Jesus said, we don't know how to pray. We've grown up as Jewish people knowing how to pray. We don't know how to pray because you're different. And he says, pray this way. So do that if you must. The third, pray as a gut response. As a gut response. Corey Ten Boom, if you're familiar with her story, she survived the horrors of a Nazi concentration camp. I believe every one of her family perished in those camps uh, of her immediate family. She once said, really asked this question, is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? Is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? I think for the early church, it was their steering wheel. We're going to look at that. Um, about five weeks ago, we drove up the Alcan Highway and we did all kinds of research ahead of time uh, on what, you know, what should you take, what kind of supplies, how stout your vehicle should be. And then you start reading blogs and websites and everybody's like, 
oh, you need at least two spare tires, like one or two really good spare tires and all these. And then you start to freak out and it's like, what are, what are we actually, what kind of war torn land are we going to, you know, as we drive up here, that's just going to eat apart our tires. Um, but to, to alleviate that, uh, I had someone who's driven that highway several times. My older brother just say, Hey, just buy new tires and you're fine. Just buy four new tires. And if you have a spare that holds air, you're good. And he's like, I've never had a flat on the Alcan because I had good tires, right? So what, what's interesting about that is, is I didn't have to worry about the spare tire. I just concentrate on the wheel. That's it. So it's the same with prayer. I just concentrate on, on the wheel and enjoyed the journey. I didn't have to kind of go, oh, but if something goes bad, that, is that spare tire going to... And, and I think sometimes we do that in life where it's like we just kind of fly forward, but kind of think, oh, well... I'm directing my own path and grabbing the wheel and doing my own thing. But if it goes bad, then prayer is my spare tire, right? Of, okay, God, now I need you. Sorry, I haven't talked to you in like three years, but things are bad and now I need you, right? The, the early church did not operate that way. God was their steering wheel. Let's dive a little bit deeper. Let's go to Acts chapter four. What we really see here is a prayer meeting. Chapter 4, starting in verse 23. So what's happened here is uh, many of them have been arrested. Now, they've just been released, but why were they arrested? Well, they were arrested because of Peter's sermon back in Acts chapter 2, right? Then the boldness of that sermon, and that all of them were starting to have this boldness and speaking out and saying, you Jewish leaders, you crucified Jesus and all these things. And so they were starting to get arrested for this. So they had just been arrested because of boldness of speaking. Then they were released and then they were threatened to never preach this new gospel of Jesus again in this area. So that's the scene that's happening here in Acts chapter 4. Verse 23, let me read these verses. When they were released, so again, just fresh out of prison. They're on work release right now, okay? So just fresh out of prison, arrested for being bold for Jesus, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. Again, there's that first response. Prayer is a gut reaction. They lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, now here they're quoting Psalm chapter 2, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, and against his anointed. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were to gather together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So what can we learn by just observing, just kind of being a fly on the wall of this prayer meeting? A couple things. This is really the meat of what I want you to think about this morning. Their prayer, number one, had perspective. It had proper perspective. I want you to notice how they start when they actually start to pray. In verse 24, <laughs> sovereign Lord. What does sovereign mean? Over everything. The word Lord that they use here in the Greek is where we get the word despot which is not a good thing in today's world. That's like a dictator, right? But what are they saying? You're over everything. You're the benevolent dictator. 
right? They are they they have a proper perspective that they are just a group of people on a tiny planet with a diameter of 8,000 miles at the edge of one of many galaxies swirling through space. And yet this God that they're praying to in the Old Testament, he said he measures the span of the universe with his fingers. So now we know through physics the immensity of how big the universe is. And the Bible says God's bigger. He measures it with his fingers, and they're saying sovereign despot, benevolent dictator. <clears throat> they're putting it in perspective. They're recognizing his authority. Um, I don't generally like to preach and, and, and have stories of our, of our kids, and because I remember as a pastor's kid how horrific that was growing up. Like, oh my goodness. Got to be careful every week that you don't make it into the sermon. But so this is this is uh, years ago. I remember when uh, when Johanna's father was still alive and he had a prayer life when he would pray and we'd gather as a family, even for a meal. He ha he had a proper perspective and he would often begin his prayers with, oh, sovereign God or almighty father is something. And it wasn't just like pretentious words of, you know, like Jesus said, oh, the, you know, some just pray to have their words heard. It wasn't like that. It was from the heart. But I remember one time it was a Thanksgiving or something and it was, uh, we were going to pray. And then I think somebody said, uh, I think Johanna said, hey, dad, would you pray? And uh, I won't name names, but like there was a collective like, <sighs> amongst the kids because they knew grandpa's prayer would take time because he had to put things in perspective of saying, God, this is who you are before we even get to the point of the prayer, right? And so, but that has to take place and it doesn't have to be wordy. If you were to read this, this prayer that I just read, it's less than a minute, maybe like 45 seconds, right? It doesn't have to be some big flowery thing, but we have to have the perspective and that's the Lord's, the Lord's prayer. Pray this way, Jesus says, our Father who is in heaven. Holy, hallowed means holy. Holy, set apart is your name. So it's proper perspective. Number two, their prayer had honesty. Man, that's a characteristic that's often missing in the church. Honest. Now we hear about that. Churches will like advertise themselves. We're authentic. If you're telling me you're authentic, you're probably not. <laughs> I want to just see it and observe it without you marketing that you're authentic, right? But just honest. So look at the language here. Down in verse 29, I think. Verse 29. So they, they, they have perspective, several verses of just like, sharing about who God is and what he knows. In verse 29, now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants boldness so that we can speak with boldness. Now, they're not saying it directly because the, the, the Greek is, is worded a little bit differently, but they're honestly saying there is fear. Otherwise, why pray for boldness? Hey, we were bold. Uh, Peter was really bold because he puts his foot in his mouth before he thinks. And so we were bold and John and James. And in fact, James at some point in the beginning of chapter 12 will be killed when Peter's put in prison. So, hey, there was boldness, but now we need more boldness. Why? Because now there's fear. They're just honestly saying, Lord, this is a situation. Yes, God knows it because he's sovereign. He's the sovereign despot. He knows it, but we're, we're telling that to him. Lord, I recognize the posture of my heart says, I need you. I'm being honest. This is my struggle. Sometimes it's as simple as Peter saying he's drowning. He says, Lord, save me. Are you just being honest? I need you. At this point in my life, I need you. And it's being honest. It's not coming with flowery and pretentious words. It's recognizing who God is, proper perspective. And then it's honest. Now, sometimes we can be too honest. But scripture allows for that. Psalm 58, 6, Jesus, or David is saying, oh Lord, break the teeth out of the mouth of my enemies. How cool. Have you ever wanted to pray that prayer, by the way? <laughs> when you're really mad at somebody, it's like, it's in the Bible. I can pray it. Lord, bless these words. You, you know, no. 
But what is David doing? He's being honest. My enemies are all around to destroy what? Not just him, the temple, the place, the holy place of the Lord. And he's guarding that and saying, break the teeth out of the mouth of my enemies. He's just being honest. Just being honest. Years ago, um, it was about 2015. I won't tell the whole story, but we were on a, a long, uh, about a three-week sabbatical, taking time away from our missionary work and heading to the Southwest and enjoying all kinds of things. And, and my brother, who's, who lives in Alaska, uh, uh, we borrowed his, uh, he was down in the 48, at lower 48, we borrowed his RV, rickety old RV. You have to know it's a, it was a rickety old RV, we found out, broken in almost every way possible. But we're coming out of Death Valley, um, Death Valley National Park, and to go out of Death Valley, you've got to climb some serious elevation in just about any direction. So we're going up. I think we crested at about, so Death Valley, we're below sea level. And we crested to about 9,000 feet. And then we're going back down. I think it was an 11% grade or 12% grade or something like that. Well, the brakes quit on us. And so we're going down and basically out of control. And I'm trying to do everything. I'm shifting down. I broke the parking brake. I see like sparks flying and all kinds of things. And we're going down like this faster and faster and faster. And at one point, my wife just prayed an honest prayer. She, and, and, and specific, I'll get to that in a second, but her honest prayer was, Lord, we need you now. We need you now to stop this thing. Right. And I'll get, I'll get to how, how that prayer was answered because we're still standing here alive. But, um, but she was just honest. She was honestly saying, this is my struggle. Did God know that? Of course. A, a characteristic of God is that he's omniscient. That means he knows all things. I heard somebody say one time, for God being omniscient, we sure do inform him of a lot of things. <laughs> Lord, in case you weren't aware, this is my situation. And we just go on and on and on, right? But we need to be honest. It's a posture of the heart, right? So prayer had perspective. It had honesty. Their prayer had balance. So look at this. Several verses. Sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and the earth. And he's talking about, he's connecting it back to the messianic psalm of Psalm 2. He's talking about your plan, um, your hand, your predestined thing. It, it's all about God. I want to recognize who you are. So there's that perspective. But the balance is, then the request comes. So first the reverence for God, then the request. So if you look at the Lord's Prayer, Jesus didn't say, hey, Pray in this way. Give me my daily bread, O Lord in heaven. Right? He started out with a balance. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. So there was a balance there of saying, God, we know you're in control. We know that Jesus is the Messiah that was written about in Psalm chapter 2, 1,500 years earlier. We recognize all that. Now, Lord, look at the threats and give us boldness. So there was balance there. There was a proper balance. Their prayer was specific. Number four, their prayer was specific. Verse 29 of chapter 4, And now, Lord, look upon their threats. Grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Now, I don't mean to make fun of this next thing, uh, but I'm going to poke it a little bit. Um, some things just need to be poked once in a while. Growing up in the church that I did, unspokens dominated the spokens. And there's times when an unspoken prayer request is, is, a, is a good thing. It's, it's sometimes uh, something that you have going on in your life is just too difficult to put into words or there's not necessarily a safety net where you can put that out to the church. But here would be my encouragement. I, I grew up in a church where you'd look at the bulletin or the prayer request things and there's like 18 unspokens and, you know, 12 spokens. And, I, and as a kid, even, I'd, I just kind of wanted to go, just speak it. Just like say the unspoken. You know, is it, is it something that can be 
actually spoken. And, and here's why. Imagine going into a restaurant and saying to the, you sit down at the table and the waiter or waitress comes up and, and just say, I have an unspoken food need. If you could just bless me with that need, they'd be like, what? It wouldn't make any sense. They'd be like, what do you want? It's unspoken as far as the food need goes. And you don't know my particular medical situation of what I need because it's unspoken. But if you could just bless me and bring it to table five, right? That wouldn't work. But if you say, hey, I'll have the number three or the whatever with the this on the side, then they're like, then we can meet that need, okay? So again, I'm not making fun of it, but here's where my challenge would be. If you are specific, about your request. Yes, God knows. God knows the unspoken. He knows the groanings of our heart. He knows if there's been abuse and hurt in the past that you can't necessarily speak to a group. I get all that. But if you're specific, if you can be, then your request, for example, if we're in a small group or a gathering on Sunday night or whatever, and somebody says, I have this thing that I'm dealing with and I want to share it with you. Would you pray for me? Or if someone calls a friend and says, hey, would you pray? And they're specific and they speak that out. Guess what happens when that request is answered? You are blessed to then hear in that small group or you call that friend back and say, even even if it's months later and say, you remember that thing that I told you about? That specific thing that I spoke to you that I'm dealing with? I want you to hear how God answered that prayer. Now, you could say, couldn't you get the same blessing from the unspoken? No, I had no idea. But if I could then write that in my journal and say, I'm going to be praying for Benny or or whoever because there's this need. And then he calls me or he sees me at church and goes, hey, man, this is how that was answered. And I'm like, wow, what just happened there? Our fellowship just got deeper because he could confide in me and speak a request We could take it to the Lord together and then we can glorify God because it was answered. Because again, these four things grew the church to the point where they're a ragtag group of about 120 people. And then we fast forward to Acts chapter 17 where it says, these are the people that have literally turned the world upside down. Well, how do you do that with those four things? The teaching of the word is God communicating to us truth. Fellowship is gathering together and encouraging each other with those truths. The breaking of the bread is a little bit more intimate fellowship and then recognizing that a key part of that truth is Jesus dying on the cross and we're having communion together and prayer is the natural fellowship response to say we're taking those truths we've been told and reflecting them back to God. That's how the church grows through that. So be specific in our prayers. Uh, several years ago, our son Ethan is here. If you haven't met him, he's, he's, he's the only boy now in, in our, in our row back there because we only girls came with us north, but there's Ethan. When he was younger, um, we, uh, we were getting ready to move from out in the country outside of Kansas City to the ur- more urban area to do ministry with refugees. And we were downsizing a lot of our animals and things like that. And he had some ducks that he needed to sell. And so we've always taught the kids from a young age, be specific in your prayers. Take anything to the Lord. Whatever's on your heart, big or small, the almighty sovereign God it, it is not, you cannot shock him with whatever you're going to pray, whatever that prayer request is. So, Ethan at supper one night prays because he was worried that no one would come and buy his ducks. He's raised ducks since he was little, loved ducks. Chickens are easy to buy and sell. Not as many people want to buy ducks. They're a mess. What do we do with the eggs? Things like that. And so at supper one night, he comes and he's very specific in his prayer. He said, Lord, because he had read on the internet that certain people from Asian countries, certain Asian countries love ducks. That's very random, right? So he prayed, Lord, please bring someone to buy my ducks and please let them be Asian. (laughs) Right? And you're like, isn't he limiting God? No, he's not limiting the sovereign despot of the universe, right? 
Shortly thereafter, I got a message because I had put them on Craig, the, the listing on Craigslist. Nobody had ever responded. Shortly after the meal, I got an email or a text or whatever. Hey, I'd like to come look at your ducks and buy them. And so I'm like, okay, here's the address. And they showed up and guess what? They pulled up and out of the car hopped like three Asian guys and they bought every single duck and then they took off. And he still remembers that, that specific prayer of God saying, or him saying to God, Lord, I need to sell my ducks. We're moving and let them be Asian. So, and I only say that to say the sovereign God of the universe cared enough to say, I want to kindle in a little boy's heart the fact that I hear prayers and I hear specific prayers. Lastly, their prayer was according to God's will. And this is the really bring it home part. So not only was their prayer have proper perspective, (coughs) their prayer also had honesty, it had balance, it was specific, it was according to God's will. So let's look at the the context here. They had just been released from prison. (coughs) being arrested for their boldness and speaking this new gospel that was offensive to everyone in power. They did not pray for this persecution to end that we know of, they might have, but it's not here. We don't see them praying for protection or protect us, keep us safe, travel mercies as we walk around. And those aren't bad things to pray for, but that's not their focus here. They did not boycott. They did not organize a riot. They did not try to do any subversive things. They just simply said, Lord, grant us boldness to do the thing that you, according to your will, told us to do just before Jesus left this earth. Excuse me. The last marching orders of the Lord Jesus Christ was to go with boldness and preach. Here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, next door to the ends of the earth. And they press into that as difficult as it will be. James is killed. Later, Peter is killed. Paul is killed. Okay, I think John is really the only one of the original that gets to be an old man. Most of them were killed because of this boldness. And they pressed in. And they didn't say... Take it away. They didn't say, let this cup pass from me. Now, that was a prayer of Jesus, but he also knew the will of the Father was for him to press on to the crucifixion. And that was Jesus being honest, by the way. If it is at all possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do this but he pressed on according to God's will. So we have to pray with that in mind. They prayed and said, we, as difficult as this will be, lives will end here with what we're going to do. Give us the boldness so that we can press on and do this thing, knowing the consequences. We don't pray like that. We often pray, I think, according to like, okay, we want to do some things for the Lord, but a lot of protecting and helping and, and, you know, and that kind of a thing. We don't generally want to pray according to God's will. If we're honest with ourselves, there's a story of a church, uh, years ago, they got a new organ, a uh, brand new organ is beautiful. And, uh, and they were so excited to hear it on that Sunday morning and, so the organist gets up there and she's ready to play. And, you know, they do the kind of, you know, they're red. And then she puts the fingers on the keys. No sound. No sound at all. Well, the pastor sees this and he comes up and starts to pray. It's kind of a camouflage so that people can figure out what's going on. Everybody, they, they raise money. They want to hear this. Well, one deacon knew why it wasn't making any noise. It wasn't plugged in. So while the pastor's praying... <clears throat> giving them some cover, <clears throat> excuse me, the deacon goes and plugs it in, writes a little note to the organist, and he, on the note it says, after the prayer, the power will be on. 
<clears throat> Think about those words. After the prayer, Stephen's like, he's a musician, he gets it. After the prayer, the power will be on. But that's applicable for all of us. Having that posture of the heart, after I pray, the power is on. Let's look at the end of this. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. That's a reminder of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came in and this divine wind and the place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. <clears throat> the prayer is answered and they're filled with boldness. Why was the prayer answered? And there's times I get it. We pray and we pray and it's not answered. It's not answered according to maybe the way we would want it to be answered. Why was it answered here? I think it because a couple things that had perspective. Sovereign Lord, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. There was honesty. We are weak. We had boldness. Now our natural weakness is taking over. We need boldness again. It had balance. There was the reverence for God, then the request. Lord, you are good. You are amazing. Lord, you are just directing everything, but this is our need. It was specific because the, in that specificity, it blesses the fellowship when it's answered. It was according to God's will. <clears throat> and it was according to God's will. Here's my encouragement for us this morning. I thought, I thought long and hard about how do you, how do you, how do you give a challenge of application? Some of it could just be what you've heard you just take and go, yes. My, my challenge would be to take a close look at your prayer life. <clears throat> and what, wherever, it's, what, wherever things are missing, number one, if you don't do it consistently, start there. Number two, if you, don't, if you, if you can't do it, if you're like, ah, I want to be a person of prayer, then every morning when you wake up, pray. Every day when you take your lunch break at home or at work, pray. And not just, Lord, thank you for, earnestly pray what's on your heart and be honest and specific and as you end your day. So start there. Start gathering together with others in the fellowship and pray there. Take scripture. Sometimes it's as good as just opening the Psalms and pray those words back to the Lord. That's exactly what was happening here where they're like, hey, Psalm 2, we get it. You're the Messiah. You're in control. The nations are against you. You're his anointed. They're against us. Come help us. Have the boldness, not, not help us get out of this jam, but have the boldness to do what you did, which is to share, share the gospel, right? So that was praying scripture back. So it's just maybe, maybe starting there with a consistency with some habit in place, praying together, being honest, being specific, and praying scripture back to the Lord. I think, if you remember a couple weeks ago, I shared with you that story of that bridge between West Virginia and Ohio. It's like in the southeast area of Ohio that collapsed, if you remember that. Uh, several dozens of people were killed because it, it collapsed due to stress uh, during the, uh, the rush hour home. <clears throat> Lots of people fell into the water and drowned. And they discovered that it was because of tiny little micro stresses that were in the, the metal of the bridge that were undetected to the human eye and had just been painted over by previous crews. And it was that bridge accident that actually really had the, the Transportation and Bridge Authority of the United States re-examine how they look at bridge health but I'm convinced the more I dive into this that the struggles of the church today are because we have micro stresses that we don't know exist that are causing weakness. And churches are crumbling because the teaching of the word, the gathering of the fellowship, the breaking of the bread and prayers together are not what they should be. So I think we can all be honest in that and say, where am I missing? And not look at the church as a whole, but just starting with getting on our knees. Lord, I am missing out 
on a vibrant prayer life. It doesn't have to be the people of the past or the well-known Christians that have the vibrant prayer life. It can be each one of you. To have a prayer life that actually changes you and moves mountains. So the question is, do you want that? I do. For me. And I want that for you. And that's the decision we make in response to the word is, Lord, give us that prayer life. Give us a prayer life that draws this body close together. And that makes a difference in the church. 